Well, today we come to the end of our study through the book of Romans. We've spent the last two years together looking through this incredible book, and even at two years, honestly, we've only scratched the surface of all that is contained within the book of Romans. We could have spent many more years together looking at just this book. We've seen that this book is one that is dedicated to describing the wonders of salvation. Romans explains why it is that we need to be saved, how it is that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. The wonder that salvation changes us and transforms us, and how once we belong to the King, we are secure in that relationship, for we are always His child when we have been made His. We've seen that once we are saved, we are changed from what we once were, and we have a responsibility to live differently in light of that. Paul began wrapping up his letter back in chapter 15, and he finally gets to the conclusion here in chapter 16. And in the final 10 verses of the book, Paul continues to provide us with some important truths that we are to apply to our daily lives. Three important reminders that Paul shares in his final words to the Romans in his final wrapping up of this book. The first reminder we see in verse 17 is that we are to stay away from troublemakers. Turn with me, if you have not yet already, to Romans 16 as we pick it up in verse 17 as Paul begins his conclusion here. He says this, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. Keep your eye is a translation of a single Greek word, skopeo. It means to notice carefully, to watch out for danger, to be vigilant, to be on the lookout. And Paul is urging the Roman believers to be ever on their guard against those who would seek to disrupt the unity and the purity of the church. They were to be those that were keeping an eye out, to be on the lookout for those individuals who did two things, who caused dissensions and hindrances, those who lived contrary to the teachings of the apostles. Dissensions is the Greek word dikostasia. It means dissension. It means that which causes division or which splits a group. It refers to things that would split a church apart, that would rip families and friends asunder. This is not a word that refers to just having a minor disagreement about a particular topic with someone. This is about those things that damage the unity and the health of a church body. The word hindrances is the Greek word skandalon. It means stumbling block, literally that which causes another to sin. We are reminded to cause another believer to sin is a serious offense. And we're to be on our guard, Paul says, against those who would cause others to sin. Those who cause dissension. Those who are stumbling blocks. They are individuals who are living lives contrary to the teaching of Scripture. These are the individuals that we are to be on the lookout for. That's not just referring to somebody that has a difference of opinion from us. That's not someone that's causing dissension. This is not just someone who looks at life from a different perspective from us. That's not one who is disrupting the unity. This is describing people who cause fights, those who spread strife among the brethren, those who put stumbling blocks on purpose and lead others into sin. And these are the individuals we are urged to be on the lookout for. This is talking about those who cause division in the church and almost even, if you will, take a little glee from causing division in the church. Those who try to pull people away from their current church for unjust reasons. And sadly, the reality is there are people out there who cause division in any church body they attend in. Such people have a history of staying in a church body for only a short period of time, and then they leave, and they leave not under good circumstances. They tend to cause problems, especially with the leadership of whatever church they might be in. And it's always over issues that we ought not be fighting over, but they cause a big scandal. Now, certainly there are times when a person should leave a church, serious doctrinal differences or moral failures in the leadership of a body. But these people Paul is speaking of, they don't leave churches for the right reasons. They cause problems. They leave under great distress and anger and big blow-ups, and they usually take people with them out of the church and go somewhere else. They cause church splits. They cause division and dissensions over minor issues. Sadly, we've had these people that existed in the church at large from the time of Paul, and they still exist in our day today. And Paul says, watch out for them. Be on your guard. Don't be fooled by slick-talking people, those who sneak into our church and cause divisions and separations among the brethren. 
There are others who come and put stumbling blocks. They lead people to sin. They oppose the very clear teaching of the scripture. They get people to start living in bondage to new laws or abuse the freedom in Christ and start living a life of immorality. People come and try to lead others into sin. And so Paul says, be on your guard. Just because someone claims to be a Christian, just because they talk a good game, doesn't mean that we follow them or embrace them. If someone is encouraging us to sin, if they are leading us to do anything that's contrary to the scripture, they are a hindrance and they are an individual whom Paul is warning us about in this passage. And we are told very clearly to turn away from these types of individuals. The Greek word that's used here is eklino. It means to avoid, to stay away from, to shun. See, we're not to get violent with these kind of people. We're not to fight with them. We're told to avoid them. We're to separate ourselves from them. We're to stay away from them. We're to shun them. Because if we welcome these type of individuals into our midst, they prey on the weak and the immature, and they harm the spiritual welfare of the church. And so we are reminded we must expose those who are false teachers. We don't give them a stage to speak in our churches. We are to remove those who cause dissension and lead others to sin. We're not to let such people stay among us. You know, sadly, sometimes in the church, we have the misconception that to love everyone, and certainly we are called to love everyone, means we must be friends equally with everyone or give everyone equal access to everything. And that's not true. If someone has revealed themselves to be one who disrupts the unity of the church, if someone has revealed themselves to be one who leads others to sin, if someone has revealed themselves to be a false teacher, one who teaches things contrary to the very clear teaching of Scripture, something that would lead people to hell if they were following their teaching, we are to stay away from such individuals. We aren't to be best friends with them. We're not to welcome them and have meals with them. We're not to allow them into gatherings of the church where they can prey on the weak and the immature. We're to be on our guard to ensure that we don't let wolves into the flock is the example that Paul used in the book of Acts. Paul continues to explain why we're to shun these disruptive individuals. Verse 18, For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Remember earlier in Romans, Paul made it very clear, all believers are slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are his slave. He makes that very clear in Romans chapter 6. So if someone is not a slave of Jesus, but rather a slave of their own appetites, then that person is not a true believer. They are not saved. They might say the right words on the outside. They might claim to be a follower of Christ. They might look good for the moment, but the reality is they care nothing for the Lord Jesus or for his followers. Because Paul says they are slaves of their own appetites. They are unbelievers. They are slaves of their own lust. They see other people as a means to an end to gratify their own desires. These individuals are selfish. They're arrogant. They're greedy. They're wolves. They creep into our churches looking to deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. They get those who are unaware of their true nature to believe their lies. They gain followers and they lead them down the path of destruction. You now I think of Absalom as I read of Paul's warnings here in Romans. You might remember Absalom. Absalom was David's son, and he looked good on the outside. In fact, everyone thought he just was the leader. He looked good, he was strong, he was charismatic, and yet inwardly he was an incredibly greedy man, one who wanted to rip the kingdom out of his father's hands and take it for himself. And so he began by sitting at the gate of the city and stirring up grumbling among the people towards his father. We're told that when people would come to the city for help from King David, Absalom would make up a story and say, oh, I'm sorry, my, my dad's too busy. If only there was someone who could hear your problem. Boy, if I was king, I would make sure your problem got taken care of. My dad just doesn't care about you. And he went on like that time after time day after day, until eventually he turned the hearts of many against King David and to himself. So much so that he was able to take the throne for a time by his deceit. Absalom is a good biblical example of one who caused dissension. He used flattery and deceived the hearts of the unsuspecting. Such men and women are to be avoided and we must be on our guards. When we catch someone stirring up trouble, when we catch someone lying about others, when we see someone trying to amass a personal following, 
we should be very careful of such individuals. Because the reality is, Absalom still exists today, and they still seek to creep into our churches, and so we're to be on our guard. We're told to be on our guard so we don't fall prey to these types of individuals. You know, sometimes we read a warning like this and we think it's only about being on guard against false teachers. Just warning about those who are heretical pastors and teachers. And certainly that's part of it. We must be on our guard against false teachers. But this is a warning that extends not just to those who are on stage, but those who are just within the church body as well. Those people who talk a good game and yet they're trying to lure you away from the purity of your faith in the gospel. And we're to be on our guard against anyone who would try to cause division. That means if someone is whispering in your ear things about another person in the church body, evil things, don't listen to them. Get away from that type of talking. If someone is talking about how if only they were in charge, things would be so much different. Again, that's not the type of thing we ought to be listening to. If someone is suggesting, well, what you've read in the Bible isn't really true, or you know what, you can be saved apart from putting your faith in Jesus, or you can indulge in sinful behavior, it's okay. It's time to stay away from those individuals. We must be on our guard so that we never fall victim to those who would seek to lure us away from the unity that exists within the body and the purity of our faith in the Word. Paul continues in verse 19. For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. Paul very quickly asserts the Romans have a good testimony with other churches. They weren't tolerating troublemakers or false teachers. But Paul, in his final words, just wants to remind them to remain diligent. Because while this may not be an issue now, if they're not diligent, it could become a problem in their church. The Roman church was a church who had a reputation of being obedient to God's word. What an amazing testimony to have as a church body. Oh, that this could be said of every church, that we are known as those who are obedient to God's word. We're told that this caused Paul to rejoice over these believers. That is something that every church should be known for, that we are obedient to his word. Paul says, be wise in what is good, be innocent in what is evil. That's why we're to stay away from those false servants of Christ. Because we're to be innocent in regards to evil things. We're not to associate with evil. We're not to tolerate evil behavior. We're not to embrace it. We're not to entertain ourselves with it. Because if we are friendly with that which is evil, it will drag us down. Verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Paul assures believers that one day the spiritual warfare that we face on a daily basis will end. A day will come when we will no longer need to be on our guard against those agents of Satan who seek to disrupt the unity of the body, who seek to lead people in the church into sin and, and split bodies in half. A day will come when we will no longer have those among us who aren't truly our brethren and are seeking to harm us. A day will come when we will no longer struggle against sin because one day the God of peace will crush Satan. Crush is the Greek word centribo. It means to break into pieces, to be completely destroyed or defeated. The term was used to describe breaking your enemy into small little pieces, smashing them into smithereens, you might say, is the sense of the word. To absolutely, absolutely annihilate your enemy. One day, Satan will be crushed. He will be utterly defeated. Now, this image of Satan being crushed under our feet is one of total and permanent victory over the forces of evil and sin. This has not yet taken place, but it will one day in the future. Because Satan still has an influence in our world. Just pick up a headline and you see it. He is still active in our world. He and his followers are constantly plotting evil, seeking to disrupt, try to disrupt God's plan and thwart his people. Satan was defeated at the cross, but he has not yet been crushed and smashed into smithereens. But the day will come when he will be crushed, when sin will be no more. And we as believers look forward to that day with great anticipation. And Paul reminds us of this encouraging truth here in his final words to the Romans. We need to be on our guards, but we only need to be on our guards for a little while longer. Because a day will come when we will be able to drop our guard forever. A day will come when Jesus will reign, he will crush Satan, and we will reign with Christ forevermore. And we can look forward to that day with absolute certainty, for the Scripture promises it will come. 
Paul continues, we see a second important application in his final words. And that is, we are to surround ourselves with godly friends. Look at verse 21. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you, as do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. Now, Paul goes on in these next few verses to list a number of his friends, those who were with him and who were sending their greetings to the Roman church. You might remember last week we saw in the first part of chapter 16 a very long list of names as Paul sent his greetings to those in Rome. Now he lists those who were with him in Corinth as he wrote this letter, those who wanted to send their greetings to those in Rome. And as we look at the list, I want to observe this is more than just a simple list of names. It's a powerful reminder of the reality that Paul was never a lone ranger in ministry. He was always surrounded by godly friends and co-workers. And in so doing, he set a model for us. That is, we aren't called to do life alone, but rather we are to live our life in community with other believers. This list of Paul's friends reminds us of that important truth. First mentioned is Timothy. Paul refers to him as his fellow worker. We noted last week that to be described as a co-worker, to be described as a fellow worker of the Apostle Paul was high praise indeed. It was a way of affirming that this was someone he considered a partner in the ministry. Now we know quite a bit about Timothy from the rest of the New Testament. He was one whom Paul considered to be his son in the faith, a young man that he had mentored and discipled and trained for years. Timothy joined Paul's missionary team during his second missionary journey. He traveled with Paul. He spent time with Paul in cities. He even spent time with him in prison. He's mentioned in six other epistles, plus he's mentioned in two books that bear his name that were written directly to him. He was a dear friend of Paul's. He was a faithful servant of Christ, a reminder that Paul spent time with others and, and poured his life into other individuals as he did Timothy. Lucius is less well known, he may be the same individual mentioned in Acts 13. Uh, there's a Lucius there from Antioch who commissioned Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, but it may also be a different Lucius. We're not sure. Jason and Sosipater are identified here as Paul's kinsmen. As we noted last week, that phrase most likely means they were fellow Jews, not that they were uh, blood relatives or close relatives. In Acts 17, we learn one of the first converts in Thessalonica was Jason. In Acts chapter 20, Sosipater, a man from Berea, is listed as one of Paul's companions. And so it's highly likely that those two individuals mentioned in Acts are the same ones that Paul references here. Men who, like Timothy, had been influenced under Paul's ministry. But now they weren't just those who had been converted or impacted, they were close friends and companions. And we're reminded, even in this list, that Paul attracted others to him and he sought to partner with other individuals. He was always looking to minister alongside other believers. In his letters, he is constantly referring to those who are with him by name, talking about those he sends greetings to, talking about those he was doing ministry with. Paul was serious about developing deep friendships with others. And that reality is reflected in his writings. And we ought to take this to heart because the reality is we all need godly companions those we are spending time working with and serving with for the cause of Christ. We need to ask ourselves, do we have at least one person that we could identify as a co-worker for the cause of Christ in our life? Do we have someone we could say, yeah, they're my fellow worker in the ministry? Do we have at least one person in our life whom we are sharing our spiritual walk with, sharing our joys and our struggles with? Is there a Timothy in your life? Is there someone that you are discipling and mentoring and pouring your life into to bring them along as Paul did? Do you have those you consider your friends and your confidence? Do you have people that if you were writing a letter like Paul, you could say, here's my friends, and they send greetings? If so, then that's great. That's what we are called upon to do. We're to make relationships a priority in the body of Christ. But if you don't have those type of relationships, then it's time to start making some change and seeking those relationships out. Get more involved in the church life. Seek out individuals you can be friends with. God does not intend for us to go through the journey of life as a Lone Ranger. That's why we see always in the New Testament, Paul was with individuals. That's why we have many opportunities in the church for building relationships, from potlucks to men's groups to women's groups, to Wednesday night, fellowship, friendships. They're important to our spiritual health, and we are reminded of that even in Paul's list here. Verse 22. 
I, Teteris, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Now, Teteris is not a different name for Paul. This is a different individual. Apostle Paul apparently had some sort of eye problem, and that caused him to use a scribe or a secretary to write his epistles. Paul would dictate the letter, and his secretary would write down exactly what he said. That's why oftentimes at the end of his epistles, Paul says something to the effect, look, I write my name at the end of this letter as I do with all my letters, or look at what large letters I use here. It's a sign that this was authentic to me. It was a way of authenticating the letter actually came from him. So he used a secretary, and Teteris was his secretary. Actually, quite a few authors of Scripture did the same. The Apostle Peter did the same thing with a man named Silvanius. Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, used the sec his secretary Baruch. The use of a secretary in no way diminishes the authority or the integrity of the text. It is the Word of God, spoken through prophets and apostles, written down word for word as they intended, but sometimes they used a secretary to dictate for them what they were writing, and that was the case here. And clearly, Teteris must have been a very close confidant of Paul to be trusted with writing down the inspired words of Scripture. And he adds his own greeting here. Clearly, he did so with the permission of Paul. He didn't just sneak this in and hope he could get it in under Paul's nose. Uh, clearly, this is inspired word of God as well. But we know nothing else about Teteris other than what is mentioned here. It goes on in verse 23. Gaius, host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. Cordus, the brother. 1 Corinthians, Paul says that he baptized a man named Gaius in Corinth. And it seems likely that is the same Gaius that he's referring to here because he is writing this letter from Corinth. Gaius must have had a rather large home because he's described as being a host both to Paul and to the entire church. Clearly, this was a man who was dear to Paul's heart, a very giving man. He served Paul and the entire church by opening up his home for its use. Erastus is noted as the city treasurer. That means he was a man of great influence. He was a man who held a high political office. Could be the same Erastus that Paul mentions in 2 Timothy. Cordus is only referred to here as the brother. That could either mean that he was Erastus' brother or that he was simply known as a fellow believer, a brother in Christ. And we are reminded in this list of names that Paul had a vast network of friends. He had friends in the highest social strata, like the city treasurer, the one who was obviously wealthy, had a house large enough for the entire church to meet there. He had friends like Timothy, who was simply a fellow minister. He had friends like Teteris, who was a secretary. Paul was no respecter of one's social status. He was a friend to all, to fellow believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw last week he mentioned slaves as well as freedmen as he sent his greetings to those in Rome. Clearly, Paul surrounded himself with godly friends. I think we should ask ourselves, who are our closest friends? Are they individuals that love the Lord? Do they encourage us in our walk as clearly these men encourage Paul? In Proverbs, we read this, Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companions of fools will suffer harm. Who we surround ourselves with as our closest friends impacts the type of people we become. Paul walked with wise, godly men, and they spurred him to live for the Lord, and he did the same for them. Who we surround ourselves, who we seek to spend the majority of our time with, it directs our spiritual walk. It shapes our life. Paul surrounded himself with those who were serious about their faith, and he set a model for us. We ought to be those who do the same. So we continue in the final verses. We see a third truth this morning, and that is we are to seek to give God the glory in all things. Verse 24, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, if you have a New American Standard, you'll notice that this verse is in brackets. Some other translations simply leave verse 24 out altogether. If you have an ESV, it jumps straight from verse 23 down to verse 25. That's because this verse is not found in the earliest and most reliable Greek manuscripts. Whenever you see a verse in brackets, it means that most of the ancient manuscripts of the New Testament don't have this verse, and so it really shouldn't be there in the text. And it seems highly likely that for this verse, a later scribe, when copying the book of Romans, accidentally inserted this phrase. Perhaps he copied it from verse 20, because if you look at verse 20, it's the exact same phrase. When you're copying something by hand, 
it's not unusual for your eye to jump down and repeat something that was just earlier and put it down in the wrong spot. And that seems most likely what happened here, that some later scribe, as he was copying it, his eyes got off, he copied verse 20 again, and it became verse 24 in some, older man, in some other manuscripts. Most likely this was not put in this location by Paul. It was a mistake of a later scribe. And by comparing the ancient copies of the book of Romans, we know when such a mistake happened as it did here. And that's why it's in brackets or not even included in some English translations. Verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, Paul now concludes this wonderful book about salvation by reminding us of the ultimate purpose in our lives. We exist for the glory of God. All we do, all we say, all we pursue in life is ultimately to be for this single purpose of giving glory and honor and praise to our great God. And he reminds us of that truth in these final verses. Paul writes, to him who is able to establish you. The Greek word established there is sterizo. It means to be strengthened, to be made firm. It refers to being firmly established, to be firmly grounded in something. God is the only one who can strengthen us and make us firmly grounded to face all the storms of life that we endure. He is our anchor. He is our rock. He is our stronghold. He is the one who establishes us. He is the one who strengthens us. See, we don't strengthen ourselves. We don't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and grin and bear it and make it through life by our own strength. Paul reminds us God is the one who gives us strength and we are ever dependent upon Him. And we who know Him as our Savior are fully aware of that reality. We cannot make it on our own, and so we come to the one who is able to strengthen us. And the way that God strengthens us is according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus. Now, Paul refers to the gospel here as my gospel. Now, that doesn't mean it was only his in the sense that it was something he made up and it's his gospel. Paul's gospel was the same gospel preached by every other apostle and every true disciple of Jesus Christ. His gospel was the good news of Jesus. It was the preaching about Jesus Christ. To refer to it as my gospel is simply a way of identifying himself with the gospel message. He is proclaiming his own belief in all that he has preached and all that he's taught to others. It isn't just the gospel. Paul says, it's my gospel and it's your gospel. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the gospel message becomes incredibly personal. For it is the truth that changes us. It is the truth of how it is that we are saved and how we've been rescued from sin. The gospel message is preaching about Jesus Christ. It's the message that Paul has proclaimed to us throughout the book of Romans. The gospel is the good news that we were once sinners, and yet we can be saved by Jesus Christ. And the entire gospel message is presented over and over again throughout the book of Romans. Remember what we've seen back in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The gospel message tells us that we are all sinners. All of us are imperfect. All of us are flawed. All of us have rebelled against a holy God. And we desperately need a Savior. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The gospel message is there is a penalty for our sin. And that penalty is death. Penalty is eternal punishment in hell. We deserve death because of our offense. And yet God in His grace has extended the offer of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Romans 5.8 But God demonstrated His own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The wonder of the gospel message is that our penalty has been paid. Someone died in our place. They took the penalty that should be upon us and they took it upon themselves. And that someone is the Lord Jesus Christ. He died in our place. Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with a heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with a mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. All we need to do to receive the gift that has been given to us is to confess that Jesus is Lord, to believe in what He did and who He is. And the Bible tells us then we are saved. This is the gospel message. This was Paul's gospel. This is my gospel. And I pray it is your gospel message as well. But if you are here and you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, 
I urge you to come speak with me after the service. I would love to talk with you further how you can put your faith in him and how Paul's gospel can become your gospel as well and how you can be made right before a holy God. It is the gospel that God uses to give us strength and he establishes us in his truth. Paul reminds us of another precious truth about the gospel, picking up in the middle of verse 25. According to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but is now manifested. The word mystery in Greek is mysterion. It means a mystery or a secret, but in the New Testament specifically, it's a word used to refer to a truth that was not known before, but has now been revealed. And Paul uses this to remind us of how blessed we really are to be living in this age. We have insights the Old Testament saint never had the opportunity to understand because they couldn't. They didn't know the mystery of who the Messiah would be, the mystery of how salvation would be brought to both Jew and Gentile, the mystery of how prophecies would be fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah. These were all truths not clearly revealed in the Old Testament. The Old Testament saint did not understand God was three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a truth that's hinted at in the Old Testament, but not clearly revealed into the new. They didn't understand how Gentiles could come to faith and be equal heirs with the Jews. That was a truth that was hinted at in the Old Testament, but it was not made clear until the New Testament. They didn't understand how the sacrificial system would be eliminated. How would God send His Son to pay the price upon the cross as the final sacrificial lamb? Those things were hinted at, but they were only fully revealed in the New Testament. And we are a blessed people to live in this time, to understand these truths that were not known previously. And Paul continues to show us how the truth of the gospel has been manifested. He says, but now is manifested and by the scripture of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God, which has been made known to all the nations, leading to the obedience of faith. Paul explains how the mystery of the gospel has been manifested. And he gives us four qualifiers. The gospel is manifested by the scripture of the prophets, a way of referring to the Old Testament scripture. Words of prophecy given by the prophets that were foretelling of the Messiah to come. Those who wrote that one day the Gentiles would come to, say, to saving faith along with Israel. The prophets who foretold all those incredible details about the life, the death, and the ministry of the Messiah. What they wrote as prophecy, what they wrote as a mystery at the time in which they wrote it, is now simply fulfilled history. You know, if you lived in the days of Isaiah, the prophecies he made about the Messiah would have likely been a little confusing. How could a virgin bear a son? How could the Messiah be beaten and bruised? How could the Almighty be stricken, stricken for our sins? If you had lived in that day and read those prophecies, you likely would have been more than a little confused. But now looking back on this side of the cross, all of Isaiah's prophecies, they're not confusing. They are incredibly clear because we now know the truth. The reality of what he wrote was clarified through the preaching of the gospel and the coming of Jesus Christ. All the confusion from those Old Testament prophecies is clarified through the gospel. And Paul says the gospel is manifested also according to the commandment of the eternal God. A reminder to us that the gospel message is not just a good idea. It's not just my opinion or your opinion. It's not just a suggestion. It's a command given by the eternal God. And he has declared that every human being is to repent and believe the gospel. I'll put it this way in Acts 17, 30. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. God has removed any confusion. He has made it clear. It is His command. All nations must repent. When Paul says the gospel has been made known to all the nations, he doesn't mean that every individual has already heard the gospel as he wrote this. Clearly in his day, there were still people groups who had not heard the gospel. There are people groups still in our day, 2,000 years later, that have not been reached. What he's referring to is the gospel has been proclaimed to the Gentiles. The gospel is no longer restricted just to Jews, but now is for all nations. All men and women in all nations have the opportunity to come to faith in Jesus. We're told that the gospel leads to the obedience of faith. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are obeying the commandment of the eternal God to believe in Him. So obedience to our God for the believer is not just a good idea. It is what we do when we are saved. When we believe, when we put our faith in Him, we are obeying His command. We don't often think of receiving Jesus Christ as our Savior, as obedience to His command, but that's exactly what it is. When we come to Him in faith, we are obeying the one who has decreed that we must come. 
God has called all to believe in Him. That is His command. And those who refuse will sadly suffer the consequences. And those who believe receive the gift of eternal life. Verse 27. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be glory forever. Amen. There is only one God. There is no other. He is the only wise God, the one from whom all wisdom flows. He is the one who possesses all true wisdom. A reminder that His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. A good reminder is Paul concludes Romans because there are things in the book of Romans that leave us scratching our head, wondering how all this fits, and yet He is the wise God, and that means some things don't always make sense to we who are not as wise, and none of us are. And yet He has revealed Himself to us through His Son. It is through faith in Jesus Christ that we are able to have a relationship with the Almighty, one true wise God. Jesus put it this way in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There is salvation in none other. There is no other way to be in a relationship with the one true God. If a person rejects Jesus Christ, they cannot know the one only wise God. The Bible is very clear on this point. There is only one way of salvation. Only through Jesus can we know Him. And we are to give Him the glory forever. We're to offer our words and praise to Him. We're to live our lives of devotion for Him. For He is worthy of our love and our adoration and our service for all eternity. And Paul ends his letter with the word, Amen. Literally, truly, or so be it. It means, I affirm this is true. It's a way we use to end our prayers. It's affirming that we agree with that which we have just said. And Paul declares his personal amen here to all that he has written. All that he has declared in this book is true, so be it. And so he ends the book with amen. Even as Paul ends his letter, he reminds us of three important truths. We are to stay away from troublemakers. Be on our guard. Don't be deceived by false teachers or those who try to disrupt the unity of the body. We're instead to surround ourselves with godly friends, to follow Paul's example, to have those who are dear to us, who are fellow workers, who encourage us and we encourage them. And we are to seek to give God the glory in all we do, remembering that everything in our life is for Him and for His glory. In fact, I think there's probably no better lesson to heed from the entire book of Romans than even in that final phrase. All is to be for His glory. That is to be the goal of everything we do, that we give Him the glory and the honor that He so richly deserves. Let's pray.